How are we feeling? Very good? Absolutely good. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. So um, I hope more people can, can join in because I know it's the last session of the day and um, we've wrapped up the conference almost and lots of people are flying out. So um, I, I do understand that uh, some people might have to leave halfway through, but not because it's going to be boring, because it's going to be awesome. awesome, but you'll not want to leave, right? You might even miss your flights, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, setting expectations. Right. Um, I'm quite happy that um, we've made it through the three days and face-to-face -face conference. This has been the first three-day conference I've had since 2019, right? And it's, it's good to see that we, we can still do this. I come from Melbourne where the lockdown was the worst in the world, the most strictest, Cathy knows, yeah. So, um, and um, it's, it's great to be free like this with no masks, no mute buttons in front of us, right? That's the best bit, I can see you in 3D, right? And you can see me in 3D. And um, so on a happiness rating, my happiness is up from zero to 10, 10 being the happiest. I'm very close to 10 right now, right? And I want you to all think about what your happiness rating is. If it's one, unhappy, or the happiest is 10, or somewhere in the middle, right? Now, think of that number, and what we will do is we'll do a cumulative graph in this room based on the level of noise that you make when I get to your number. I will count from one to 10, 10 steps towards happiness, and all you need to do is you've rated yourself already, you know that number, as soon as I call out that number, you start making some noise or start clapping and don't stop clapping till I get to 10, right? And what we will do is have a cumulative graph of the happiness rating in this room based on the level of noise that we make, right? The other motive of this exercise is to let other people know that we are having more fun here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if your happiness rating is one right now, you may start clapping. Two, three, four, five, six, continue clapping, seven, eight, nine, ten. Woohoo! Very good, very good. It's good to know that I'm mostly surrounded by happy people here today. <laughs> and I want to keep it that way, right? So, um, and uh, I'll, towards the end, it should be all of us should be 10. I'll, I'll try my best to get you to 10, right? So, um, to celebrate this happiness, I want to share this cake story with you, right? So, a few years ago, when my daughter Ember turned six, we thought it's a good time for her to learn to bake. And what better way to learn to bake than to bake a cake, right? So I get Ember in the kitchen with all the ingredients of the cake on the kitchen bench, and we, we start looking at how we can bake this cake, the first cake that she's ever baking in her life. We, I helped her measure all the correct quantities of the cake mix, put it in the pan, she mixes it up, she's really excited about this first cake that she's ever, ever gonna bake puts it in the oven, the oven's got a see-through glass window, you know those typical ones where you can see the progress of the things that you've got inside. She's peeking through every now and then, and then after a while she gets a bit nervous and, and, and a bit, bit upset, saying, oh, Papa, look at that. I said, what? The cake's going hollow. Instead of rising, it's going hollow. And I look at the cake and sure enough, it's going like this. And I ask her, did you remember to put in the baking powder? And she goes, yeah, maybe. Maybe I didn't. Oh, yes, I did. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. And then we look at the kitchen bench, and the baking powder is still there as it was. Right. And I said, well, the baking powder is what makes the cakes rise. It's not going to rise. So it's, it's too late now. She thinks for a while. She's really upset, really worried. And she goes, Papa, I've got an idea. Why don't we open the oven door quickly, pull the cake out, sprinkle the uh, baking powder on it, and then shove it back in. And at that moment, 
reminded me of work. Because that's exactly what I face, and I guess you all face, time and time again, with somebody calling you, saying, our agile transformation's gone wrong. Right? And it's only when it goes wrong that you are asked to come in and sprinkle that agileness in the hollow cake. Right? We're all familiar with that, right? right. And it is quite sad that it, these are leaders and executives of our industries that are asking for that magic baking powder. Right? They are treating agile as an afterthought. Agile is a game changer when it comes to customer engagement. Agile is a game changer when it comes to employee engagement. Agile is a game changer when it comes to innovation. But a lot of leaders are treating Agile as a, a baking powder that's sprinkled on top at the end. Right? And it's very sad that that's, that's the story of our industries today. And, and these are not small organizations. These are large organizations that are asking for that magic dust. Right? Now, based on my many experience, years of experience with working with agile transformations across small and large enterprises all over the world, these are some of the most common agile barriers or barriers to agile transformations. Right? And you, you will be all familiar with this. So if you look at these ones here, what I'd like you to do is there shouldn't be anything new here. I'd like you to look at each one of these closely. And before we do that, you know it's an agile session, so I'll get everyone to stand up, please, if you can. And um, think about one of these as the, think about the organizations that you come from, or the ones that you've recently worked on that have been doing agile transformations. And if they have started, what slowed them down of this list? And if they haven't started, what's stopping them from starting? Right? Think about your last engagement. So if you think cannot change the organizational culture was the number one barrier, you may sit down now. If you think lack of agile training or experience within the organization was your number one barrier, you may sit down now. If you think concerns around implementing Agile outside of IT was the number one barrier. You may sit down now. Right. Cannot change pre-existing rigid traditional frameworks or methods. If that's your number one barrier, you may sit down now. Very good. Very good. Lack of leadership support. If that's your number one barrier, although that was the one that you figured was the one, you may sit down now. Interesting, yeah. And the last one I've got is inconsistency in the ways that agile practices are used across teams and when scaling. If that's your number one barrier, you may sit down now. Right. Very good. I'm glad that no one's standing because if someone was standing, that means you have no barriers and I would have liked to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in, in this case here, it's, it's, it's good that what we have found in this room is very conducive to the recent surveys that have been done globally by some of these surveys, like the version one one, the state of agile one, that's very popular, everyone would have seen it here, right? So the ones that they, they found were the number one barriers for agile was inconsistency in the practices, which we found was the case here, agile culture at odds, right? And the last one was resistance to change which I find interesting, because resistance to change is, is very common, not just in agile transformation, in any organization, everywhere, even as uh, outside of workforce, right? So what makes changes challenging? Here's a survey that was done by IBM a few years ago that looked at different ways of um, implementing change over, uh, globally over, uh, with 1,500 practitioners and they found that culture and mindset were the two things that most people found most challenging when implementing any change. Culture and mindset. Now, more importantly, what makes changes successful? Right? And there's no surprises here. Top management support, executive support. 
for any change to stick, you've got to have, I, I, I've been looking at um, some of the, um, like, um, transformation um, programs that are looking for people, and now they're saying CEO-led transformation program. And, and there's a reason for that, because that means that transformation is taken seriously in that organization. Right? And all, what about the ones that are not led by CEO? Are they just fun games? Are they just like things on the side? So that's, that's an interesting thought. But the other thing that I, I find really interesting here is training is last on this list. And that reminds me of another story that I want to share with you. A few years ago, back when I was living in New Zealand, um, I was invited to help with one of the, um, one of the largest insurance companies in New Zealand to, to roll out Scrum in their organization. This was quite a long time ago now. But uh, the story is really still relevant and valid. So on my first day in the organization, as you, you do, you get introduced to all of the people that he is, John, he's a developer, he's a certified Scrum Master. He's Mary, Mary's a test lead, she's a certified Scrum Master. Here's Andrew, lead architect, he's a certified Scrum Master. And what I eventually notice is every single person on that floor, the entire IT floor, had certified Scrum Master badges or certificates displayed on their desk. Every single one of them. And I felt so overwhelmed because New Zealand's a small country. And to have 150 certified Scrum Masters to gathered together in one place, I had never seen that before. And I was thinking, I'm a certified Scrum Master as well. Why have they got me here if they've got 150 of them? So, and then I later figured out that they had tried to roll out Scrum or Agile six months prior to me joining, and had failed miserably. And their tactic at that time was get everyone trained up in Agile and start doing Agile. And then someone told them, and that obviously had gone wrong badly, and then someone told them, fix your culture, fix your mindset. Okay, so how do you fix your culture, your mindset? in an organization. Do you get an agile coach or external consultant to fix your culture and mindset? No, you don't fix culture like that, right? So you can't fix culture like that because culture is something that evolves over time and the people that have the most influence in shaping or molding that culture are the leaders of the organization. There was a nice article in the Harvard Business Review a while ago that talks about this, saying you can't fix culture like this, but the leaders and everyone in the organization have to focus on their day-to-day -day actions and day-to-day -day behaviors. And then you can mold the culture by influencing and setting boundaries like setting good, good boundaries, accepting or discouraging bad behaviors and encouraging good behaviors. Right. The leaders of an organization have a huge influence in all this. Right. The culture of an organization is shaped by the worst behaviors that the leaders are willing to tolerate. And the culture of an organization is shaped by the best behaviors that the leaders are willing to amplify. Right. Both of these are equally important, but I, in the industry we're seeing that the, the former happens, the latter doesn't happen as much. Leaders are not amplifying good behavior right? enough. So what I would um, want to talk about next is all of us are familiar with any organization that's embracing new ways of working or agile ways of working or transforming to new new world. They have these kind of posters on their walls, right? Everywhere. They, they, these are common values, right? You've all seen them. What I wanted to ask, wanted to get your views on, is if you were to look at these five values, and these are common agile values, trust, courage, respect, openness, empathy. If you were to pick one or many, 
that needed more focus when working in remote or hybrid situations like we do now these days? Are there any that need more focus? Or are they all equally important? Would you pick any out here that need more focus? And, and this is again our opportunity to let other people know we're having more fun in this room than other rooms. When I call out that value, trust, like you go, yay, right? If you agree, that's the one that needs more focus. Each one of those, like you go, yay, for the one that I call out. So if you think trust needs more focus, trust. Okay. Courage. Res respect. Yeah. Openness. Yeah. Empathy. Yes. Very good. Very good. So, openness and empathy. Okay, that's interesting. What we are finding is that while courage and openness is important, leaders that embrace trust, respect, and empathy in their workforce culture by helping their employees be the best versions of themselves in remote or hybrid cultures, right? And that's what is underpinning the remote ways of culture or remote ways of working values, trust, respect, and empathy, right? Now, all of this looks good on paper. Uh, it's not, there's no right and wrong answers, by the way. They're all equally important, but these three need more focus in my, my session today is to highlight that the, the importance of these three things. Right? So what I, I'm talking about is trust first. Right? Trust is fundamental to productivity, engagement, innovation, and agility. And what is really important to note that the converse is also correct, where lack of trust will hinder all of those things. Right? So all of this looks good on on a poster, right? We see these in posters everywhere. How do we make it relevant on the ground? What do we do? We talk about trust. We, we, I did a couple of days ago, we just did a session here where we had a self-assessment and empathy was the most common trait in the people in the room. Right? Everyone was saying, oh, I'm empathetic. What does it mean? Let me, let me share some examples and stories with you. Right? And, and I felt like I was, I'm also an empathetic person. But really, do I know? How do you know? Right? So let me share a story with you. A couple, husband and wife, are having a coffee. And her phone rings. Right? So she goes, hello. Yes. Hi, how are you? Oh, yeah, no, I'm just having coffee with my hubby. Yeah. Oh, dear. When did that happen? Oh, no. Oh, that's not good. Oh, dear. No, that's really bad. Okay, I'll talk to her. Yeah, no, that's really horrible. Okay, then I'll talk to her. See ya. Bye. And she hangs up. The husband who's having this coffee with her is as curious and as concerned about what has just happened and asks the wife, what was that? What happened? What did she say? To which... The wife says, oh, nothing, honey, nothing that should bother us right now, and continues to have the coffee. Right. Now, let me bring this back to a work scenario where a customer raises a defect. The product owner shows up on the floor with the scrum master and discusses the importance of getting this defect fixed, and they both agree that this defect is not important enough to disrupt the current sprint and it can be put into the backlog for a future sprint, for consideration if you, in a future sprint, right? The product owner, not wanting to make it a big deal, logs it in his private notepad so that he can bring it up in the planning sessions later. One of the developers overheard some of this conversation and approaches the Scrum Master saying, oh, what was all that about? Did the product owner just raise another defect? And the Scrum Master goes, oh, don't worry about that. There's more things that we can focus on right now. Don't, you don't have to worry about that defect. We'll talk about that later. So in both of these scenarios, the coffee scenario and the defect scenario, we are seeing that uh, there is a lot of control over information. In the coffee scenario, the wife 
the, the husband's thinking, she doesn't trust me enough to even tell me what her best friends just told her. I'm never ever going to come back to have a coffee with her again. Right? While the wife's thinking, this is our coffee time. There is nothing more important for us than to enjoy this time together with my hubby and to enjoy this coffee time with my hubby right now. Everything else can wait. I'll tell him, tell him later as to what happened. Let me enjoy my coffee with my hubby right now. And then in the defect scenario, the developer's thinking, this scrum master's crap. He doesn't even want to share what the product owners just told him. How can he sh sh they trust us with my work? There's so much of drift feeding of information here. While the scrum master on the other side is thinking, the sole reason for exist my existence in this team is to protect them from external noises. I need to make sure that they don't get distracted and they don't get distracted by external forces or noises and focus on the most important things right now. I need to protect my team. That's my sole reason for existence. Right. All of them have got good intentions. Right. But there is a perceived lack of trust. Right. And what we're finding, the teams thrive when they're trust-based, not control-based. And the strongest pillar for agile teams is based on trust. Now, we are finding that with complete transparency, right? We are finding that, you said openness, we need that more than ever before. In the remote ways of working and the, the hybrid ways of working, it's with the absence of nonverbal cues, it's becoming even more challenging to have the transparency, to have the trust. I remember back in 2020, March, when the world changed for all of us, and all organizations were disrupted to go remote. One organization that I was coaching in at the time, I remember all the leaders getting into a room like this, and they had a big conference meeting or, or meetings discussing how can we make sure that our people, when they're working at home, are not slacking off. How can we make sure that they're working the full hours at home? Right. And they started brainstorming, and then one project manager had this brilliant idea. And it will sound familiar when I share this with you. He said, from tomorrow morning, I'm going to call every member of my team between 9 and 9.30 in the morning, and then again from 4.30 to 5 in the morning, so that I know that they're working the full day at home. It's funny, but it's true. There are still people who are thinking like that. And they are leaders and executives of organizations. They think like that. Right? And we all know them. There's at least one or two in our circles. Or more, maybe. Right? So what um, I want to highlight here is that the leaders are fa failing to recognize that it's all about the outcomes, not about the hours. Right? And what leaders need to do is make sure that we are looking at setting specific or oh, clarity of the outcome that's required by each of our team members and then specifying how those outcomes will be measured. Leaders need to demonstrate trust and empathy to empower their teams to do the work the way that they like to do it with the flexibility that they are looking for. Right. And most openly, Encourage open and clear communication to provide actionable feedback on those outcomes, not on the hours. Right. And most importantly, avoid checking in, frequent checking ins, right? Say so just to check progress. And that can become, become annoying and it shows lack of trust. And then you get employees that leave or become disengaged. Right? And we are seeing a lot of that happening in the industry today. Talking about checking ins and checking ups. We can avoid checking ins by using asynchronous tools or best management practices, right? So it's not that we don't do any of it, but we've got tools that can provide even better updates, real-time updates, if you use those tools properly. Right? 
Now, talking about checking in and checking up reminds me of another story. A couple of, not a couple of months, late last year, I was going to a, a bit of a rough patch, right? And I was, there was a lot of things on at work, and there was a lot of things happening for me at, at home as well, right? And I was drowning. I was like barely surviving, right? And as we do, I started prioritizing my things, pushing out things that could have waited to the backlog, back, back of the backlog. I pushed out some of the emails that could have waited to be replied to later so that I just could keep my head above the water. Right. Now, while I'm down for the count one day, 8.30 in the evening, I remember I'm like really struggling and I get this text message from somebody. 8.30 in the evening, I'm, I'm just like out of it and I see this text message, hey, just checking if you're okay. Unusual for you not to respond. Call out if you need help. Just these words made me feel better already. Right? I'm thinking, there is somebody out there in the world who cares about me. I matter to somebody. Right? These words just magically made me just get more energy. Till I read the second half of this message, which said, I really need your help if you could respond to my email as soon as possible, thanks, with a smiley. <laughs> right? Now I'm thinking there is a distinct lack of authenticity in this message. Because right? I've started feeling even worse than I was feeling before reading this message. And if they were really checking in on me and not checking up on me, they could have just sent me a simple message saying, I really need your help if you could respond to my email as soon as possible, please, and not fabricate it. I would have been more inclined to help them, even though it was at 8.30 in the evening. And what I'm seeing in the industry these days, after the pandemic, is we are trying too hard and I fall into that trap as well, to, to come across as polite, come across as caring. And as a result, what a lot of leaders are struggling with is coming across as not being authentic. Right? And this, this only happens when you mix up the two, the checking in versus the checking up. Right? If you're really checking in on people, really, really care about them, Send a message that's as simple as this, just checking up on you with no strings attached and no expectations in return. That's when you connect genuinely, right? Don't mix the two. I fall into that trap all the time, trying to be too polite. And it, as a result, we're coming across as not authentic. Right? Don't mix the two. Okay, this is a heavy topic, isn't it? For our last session of the... the the, the last one, yeah, no, good? Okay, let's, let's have fun, fun now, right? So, who knows this guy? Usain Bolt, the fastest person on earth, right? Now, we all know this guy. This photo was taken when he won the third gold medal at the London Olympics, right? So, we're changing pace now. 2032 is when the Olympic Games are coming to Australia. I'm really excited. Yeti and I are even more excited about the Commonwealth Games, which is in 2026 in Melbourne, where we live, right? Now, when we have these kind of games, do you know what is the most popular of the sporting events in those games? Which is the most anticipated event, apart from the closing ceremony, of the opening ceremony? Track events, which one in particular? 100 meters, because you find the fastest person on earth. Right? And these days, those 100 meter races, less than 10 seconds, it's over. Then what? <laughs> then there is gymnastics and beach volleyball to keep me excited. Right? Then what? And then I look forward to, also look forward to the 4 by 100 meter relay races. Right? Anyone keen on those relay races? Yes? Very good. So we'll have fun here now. Um, so those relay races, you have the four of the fastest sprinters from every country on the track at the same time, right? And it's a team sport. 
Has anyone here had the luxury of watching a relay race live on track? Okay, not many. What about on TV? Everyone, right? Now, I have on TV. I haven't seen it live, but I'll see it at the Commonwealth Games. I'll make sure. So, here's the thing. When you are watching a relay race on TV, have you noticed that the TV is only showing the guy or the runner on the starting block with the baton? Right? There are other runners on the 100 meter mark. There's another runner on the 200 meter mark. Far and 300 meter runner, there's, they're waiting. Have you ever seen the camera focusing on the 300 meter runner? Because it will be 30 seconds by the time the, the baton gets to them during the race. What are they doing while they're waiting? They might be signing autographs, right? But I've never seen the camera focus on them. Have you? No. Because who cares? The camera always focuses on the people with the baton because the team that gets the baton over the line wins the race. Simple, right? So let's have that race here. If we were to race here and if, imagine this is the track, we go this way. Lane one, we've got USA. Lane two, we've got Jamaica. Lane three, we've got Canada. Lane four, we've got Japan. Lane five, we've got to have India. Suddenly India is good, good at running. Right. Lane six, we've got ABC Consulting. Because ABC Consulting claims that they can have four Sprinters on the track that can run 100 meters in sub 10 seconds and they are allowed to take part in this race So along with all the races ABC consulting is on track, track 6 and this is how ABC consulting is going to conduct this race So the first thing that happens is They'll introduce a track manager on the track Right so ABC consulting track manager is going to go to the 100 meter guy. You know what? 100 meters by the time, oh, so 10 seconds by the time the baton gets to you. It's going to be easy high jump here. It will only take you seconds. You'll be back in time to take the baton to Utah, who will be running from 200 to 300 meter mark. You know, 20 seconds by the time you get the baton, there's a long jump happening here. Can you just quickly do the run, long jump back in time to finish, pass the baton to the 300 meter runner here? Yeah? And 300 meter runner, 30 seconds by the time the baton gets to you, right? The one in the corner. You can be signing autographs or whatever, but instead, what I'll do is I'll get you to run that 100 meters just beside here on track two, okay. right? And you'll be back in less than 10 seconds to finish the race for us. And that way, we are all fully utilized, <laughs> right? And the race starts. The baton gets to the 100 meter guy, he's huffing and puffing his back, way back from um, the, the high jump he's just done. Goes to Utah for, the, for the passing the baton, who's just finishing off the long jump there, comes back, takes the baton in time, but instead of running that way, she runs that way, because she's got no context of this race, right? And then everyone says, oh no, the other way, the other way. Then she chucks a UE and goes the other way to find the 300 meter runner, who is still waiting for the 100 meters to start next door. Nowhere to be seen on this track. Right. And while the, all the other runners are finishing the race. And it is not just consulting organizations. A lot of organizations are conducting races like this because the leaders are focusing on keeping the runners running rather than getting the baton moving. And it's really sad to see those organizations conducting races like that. Right. Sounds familiar? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, what I, um, I also want to talk about is, as leaders, we, I, I fall into that trap all the time. I feel important, I feel more in demand when I take in more work, and every project, every new thing that's come into my portfolio, I feel like, oh yeah, I'm in demand, I feel important, and I never say no to things because it makes me look important. 
And as leaders, we want to show off how many things that we have in our control and our belt. Right? And what we need to do is change that thinking, and it has to start from the top, where stop the organizations that are measuring people on how busy they are, rather, and, and instead me measure people on how many, what they're producing, the outcomes they're producing. Right? If you do that, then it, this becomes easier. And then the other way that we can do, change that thinking is, treat work in progress as a liability rather than as an asset. Right? Now, that change of thinking will start helping us, but it's easier said than done. As leaders, we'll, when we look at our project teams, our scrum teams, and we minimize their work in progress on walls, and we can highlight it for them and make them do more or less things in the work in progress things, that's easy. Lift it up to the leadership level, and I can tell you that is a great challenge. Right. So, the trick is to start finishing and stop starting, and slow down to go faster. Right. Now, talking about slow down to go faster, there are three good things that exist in any good agile environment. Three elements. Right. Anyone wants to guess what those three are? Not, not the values, three, three elements. Like, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Ooh. Yeah. What I'm looking for? Close. Yes. Transparency, inspection, and adaption. Right? Those things exist in every good agile environment. Right? Because only if you have transparency, you will have ability to inspect. Because if you can't look under the hood, you won't know what's wrong. And only when you know what's wrong, you know what to adapt. Right? So it starts with transparency, allows for inspection, and that enables adaption. Right? So when I go to a new team, or any team, and they say, oh, you guys, you were, last month you were part of a traditional project, this month you are, you've just joined the Agile project, what's different? How do you operate differently? What's the answer? We sprint faster, we have shorter sprints, or we have sticky notes, or we use Jira. No. It's the only thing that a good agile team will be regularly asking themselves is how can we get better? There's nothing else important, more important than asking this question all the time. And as leaders, we need to allow our teams to stop and take stock, to enable them to continuously improve, continuously improve, so that they can return better return on investment for our customers, right? Making things more efficient and making things in, 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 in the ways of working better, right? Along with the product. Now, when we look at um, talking to leaders, and I'm sure you would have all experienced this, I say, do you do retrospectives and things like that? We do continuous improvement. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do, we do. We do PIRs. Every end of project, we do a postmortem. Who does it here? Postmortems. Yeah, most nods? No? Yes? And that's, that's the answer for continuous improvement. But postmortems, the person's already died. The project's finished. It's too late. Oh, no, 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 we apply the learnings to the next project. I haven't seen many projects where all the learnings of one project have been applied to the next project, have you? Yet to see one. <laughs> Yet to see one, right? And then eventually you tell them, oh, you know, like, it's better to go and get medical checkups when the person's still alive. It's more useful. <laughs> Same with projects. And then eventually they agree. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do projects, oh, yeah, retrospectives. But they're really upset about it because it's not productive time. We're not cutting code. And everyone's stopping, 
work to do ret retrospectives, and it's, it's considered a waste of time. And sometimes what I find is what I call check-in-the-box retrospectives. That's what happens. And I, you'll, you'll know when I talk about it. I'll share this with you. Check-in-the-box retrospective. What's going well? There's always a sticky called good communication. <laughs> and there's another sticky, good teamwork. Right? And then, what's not going so well? And this is a classic. There's always a sticky around, our test, ne test coverage needs to improve. Right? And if you this, see these themes that they are repeating fluffy kind of things every, every retrospective, you know it's a check-in-the-box retrospective, so call it out. Right. Yep. So, what, um, what I want to ask you next is, um, every organization is striving towards becoming a learning organization, and we all like to do innovation, experiments, pilots, first of a kind, this and that, right? So, and we have innovation hubs these days. And innovation hubs are where experiments happen, and it's okay to fail and all that. Right. How many people here have been part of those kind of things? Yes? Not many, though. Okay. But have you had a, a, a project that was like a pilot or test POC or whatever? At least you've got that, right? Yep. Okay. Think about this. You don't have to answer it. Think about what happened when that experiment was hugely successful, where the people in the team Rewarded? Don't have to answer it, just think about it. Right. Were they rewarded? And what if that experiment failed? If that experiment failed, were they still rewarded? Or were they punished? And the last thing I want to consider in this topic is after a failed experiment, were the members of that team still as motivated to be part of another experiment, or were they encouraged to be part of another experiment, or not? Because the answers to these questions say a lot about how safe the people are feeling to try out new things without the fear of failure in your organization. And if you want to take out just one message out of this talk here today, Make it this one. As leaders, we want to make sure that we are creating an environment where it's not just the small wins that are celebrated, but failures are celebrated as well. Right? And I'm not seeing a lot of organizations that are celebrating failures. Right? It's equally important to learn from our failures and amplify that and share the learnings in the group not just the ones that we have won, right? because there are more learnings in the failures. We all know that. But how do you do that? Firstly, trust, respect, and empathy. If you are underpinning that in your values of your organization, this becomes really easy. I used to work in an organization where we used to have a, a failures wall. And every time anybody had a failure, they would write a sticky, put it on the wall, and replenish that wall with stickies every week because every Friday we would get there around that wall and talk about the learnings of every failure and applaud the people that had put stickies in there right. because there was rust, trust, respect, and empathy. And that was a true learning culture. Right. Now, if you look at... Um, Psychological safety, again, big words, right? How does it, what does it make any, how does it make any difference? So if people are not feeling safe to call out their own failures, you don't have that psychological safety. Right? So don't just use those words. If leaders are saying, oh, we, we're creating psychological safety, ask these three questions to those leaders, the ones that I just asked you. Ask them these questions. And if it's a yes, yes, and yes, yes, you've got the psychological safety then. Right? So, next bit. Each one of us have got some good qualities and perhaps not so good qualities. Right? Now, what I want you to do is look at these 14 weaknesses, common weaknesses that all human beings have. Most, 
most common ones here. And of these 14, just pick three that, you, that resonates most with you. Right? Which of these 14, which of the three are the, the most relevant for you? Right? And don't worry, we won't share your weaknesses with anybody else. It's just for your own good, this exercise. And don't worry, the next bit's more interesting, right? So don't get too, too, too depressed with three of these, right? Everyone ready with their three biggest weaknesses of this list, right? If you're ready, go, yay! yay. Some, most people are not ready. Right? <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll share my biggest weaknesses. I'm number three, I'm stubborn. I'm shy, number six, and I'm indecisive, number 13. Right? That's what my wife tells me anyway. <laughs> right? So now look at the traits on the right-hand side of your three biggest weaknesses. Right? Now, just because I'm stubborn, I'm dedicated. Just because I'm shy, I'm reflective. Just because I'm indecisive, I'm patient. Hidden in each of our strengths is, oh, sorry, hidden in each of our weaknesses is a strength. Now, this is a great team building exercise when you are building new teams. Because as leaders, what we normally do is we share each other's strengths, right? And it's easy to talk about strengths. Or what's your superpower? What do you bring into this team? We hardly talk about, oh, what's your weakness <laughs> on the first day we meet? Because it's we feel vulnerable, right? To share our weaknesses with other people that are strangers and we have just met. It's, it takes a lot of courage, right? Now, if you are looking at doing these leaders, what we need to realize is that it's important to share the strengths, but if it's even more important to share our weaknesses with each other, and that's when you have a well-oiled humming machine. Only when you know each other's strengths as well as the weaknesses. And when you're putting teams together, it's important to know that, yes, you've got to have a broad horizon of strengths, but at the same time, for this kind of exercise to work, you've got to have everyone with a huge overlap on the shared values. In this case, the values of trust, respect, and empathy for this kind of thing to work. Right. If you don't have that overlap of values in the team, you can forget about it. Right. Now, this is my last bit for the session and probably for the conference. Each human being has an invisible post-it note on our foreheads. Right? And it says MMFI, each and every human being. Can anyone guess what MMFI stands for? Anyone? Any guesses? Make me? Close? Make me feel important. Right? And we should never, ever forget this message when we are dealing with people. Right? Because as leaders, the words that we use impact the attitude of others around us and how we make them feel. And this reminds me of one last story. Can I share one last story before we end the conference? Yes? We have one more story? Okay. So a while ago, when I moved to Melbourne, I was invited to um, help with a organization that was uh, running a project that was run in a very waterfall manner. And they said, oh, no, we, don't, we want to run this in Agile now because it's only Agile because the time is fixed and the scope is fixed and it's only Agile that will help deliver this project. And I was the lucky one to be chosen to, to help them move to Agile, right? So first day on, um, on, on the floor again, I'm, I'm looking at the where everyone is and everything. And I noticed that after a few days, there's no leadership presence on the floor. There's only doers. Like, there's no executive managers, project managers, delivery leads, no one like that. So a week later, I called the EGM of the department and said, you know what? It would be nice for you to get involved in some of the things that we do this with this Agile team here. Why don't you come around one day and, and tell them why we're doing this project and give them a motivation talk, whatever, right? So, and he agrees. He said, next Tuesday I'll be in this building, so I'll, I'll come around and talk to the team. And I'm so excited. Finally, we've got some engagement with leadership here, right? And then um, Tuesday morning, surely enough, he comes around. I get the team together around him. We form a circle. 
and I'm standing beside him, and he's doing this motivation talk. He agrees, right? So, and I wrote this motivation talk word to word after he did it. Right? And I want to read it out to you. Imagine the teams just met him for the first time, and he's going like this. It's the EGM. Starts. The November date is fixed. There is no room for negotiation with this date. The scope is fixed and socialized with the business. I empower you all to do whatever is necessary to deliver the agreed scope by this date. You are empowered to make all decisions with regards to how you want to implement this new product. If for any reason you are not able to deliver your pieces or if I find that you are delaying your pieces by waiting for answers, I will crucify you. <laughs> These were the exact words of the EGM, empowering the team. And I'm standing beside him, and I've lost all feelings in my legs and crumbling down. Was like <laughs> and we need to remember that as leaders, we need to realize that it's not just our actions and behaviors, but also our words that create the culture and help mold that culture around us, right? It's the words that we use that impact the attitude of others around us, right? And we've got a choice of words. Notice how there are some words that just drag energy down like that one. And there are some other words that just project the energy upwards in the room, right? And as leaders, what I... I would request everyone to do is consider the choice of words because our words impact like it's we, we've got to make sure that we project out that good energy out to the world. By choice of words we project out good energy to our organization and then also project out that good energy to our the teams and individuals in those team uh, in those organizations. Right? So as leaders, use our words to project out that good energy. I hear some, some words like execute, terminate, headcount, all in the same sentence. And it seems like it's the scene from the Terminator movie where Arnold's going to be back and someone's going to get hurt real bad. Right? <laughs> so look out for those because sometimes we forget about how Others are perceiving those words. We forget about what is it coming across as because our words really, really impact how other people feel when they're listening to this. Right? So, and, and I was, um, we've got this um, uh, newspaper in Melbourne which is called The Age. And um, there's also a, a, just like cricket here, in Melbourne it's the Australian Football League, AFL for us, right? Where it's, it's, it's a religion. And the headlines are always brutal win, slaughtered, right? It, it's like in the sporting area, in, in the sporting space, it, it's become like that as well, where it's all about brutality and slaughter and all that, rather than a good win or convincing win or, or showing some sportsmen, right? So let's start from, from the organizations and, and avoid those kind of language. Right. Anyway, I think I've done enough for the language thing. Back to the cake. <laughs> so we all know it's all about the cake, right? So as leaders, project managers, or in people with influence, or remind the people who are with influence around us that it is not just our actions, our behaviors, our ways of working, but our words as well that impact everything. And Agile has to be pervasive into everything like that. Right? So it starts from the beginning, not sprinkled on top. Right? I just want to summarize the seven things that we talked about in this session here today. The first one was, can't create culture overnight. The leaders have the most influence in shaping and molding that culture. Leaders who create trust, trust respect, and empathy in their workforce are the ones that are en enabling their workforce to be the best they can be. It's about outcomes, not the hours. Focus on the baton, not the runners. Right? 
the last one, uh, sorry, the next one is checking in, not checking up, with authenticity. That's when you really connect. Stop starting and start finishing. Treat work in progress as a liability rather than as an asset, please. Right. Number six is slow down to go faster, continuous improvement. Right. Slow down to, for that. And the last one is using the power of words to project out that good energy. M-M-F-Y. Make me feel important for all of us, right? Thank you. Right on the bell, right? <laughs> really want to thank you, each and everyone, for your patience and, and staying awake for the, for the entire session because this is the last of the conference and I hope you enjoyed it. And um, we'll keep in touch. Please connect with me on LinkedIn or wherever and we'll, we'll be happy to talk about anything that we've talked about. And thank you to every one of your uh, smiley faces because it, it helps. Right. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.